Hello everyone, Dr. G here. So uh, today we're going to do a lesson on solving the time-dependent Schrodinger equation for a one-dimensional particle in a box. All right, so a lot of uh, lessons out there uh, really only cover uh, the time-independent solution. So we're going to do the whole thing today uh, for the one-dimensional particle in a box. And the reason for the image I've chosen for the uh, cover slide here is that, uh, you know, this is an example of quantum dots. And so quantum dots are uh, nanoscopic particles that are made up of uh, semiconductor materials, and they are capable of tightly confining electrons. So it's a little bit like putting an electron into a box, right? So the, the, the one-dimensional particle in a box is what we call a toy model. Uh, so that's something that, um, basically it's a mathematical construct of something kind of simple that lets us uh, gain intuition for something more complicated. Um, so basically, uh, the size of these particles, right, these quantum dots um, that these electrons can be conf confined within, uh, determine the energy levels, which is actually, this, you know, the same thing for the one-dimensional particle in a box. Uh, the value of the energies that are allowed within the box, because it's, it's quantized, right, they can't be just any energy at once, right, there, there's only certain allowed values, and uh, those are basically determined um, by the size of the box. And uh, it's the same thing with the um, quantum dots, actually. So that's how the different colors can be achieved. Uh, because, of course, you know, the different wavelengths of light correspond to different uh, changes in energy and going from one quantum state to another. So I just thought it would be nice to begin our discussion on an actual physical system that behaves very much like uh, a quantum uh, particle in a box. So uh, let's get into um, some of the background, some of the mathematical uh, things that we will want to uh, go over before getting into the quantum mechanics. So first of all, um, you know, what do we mean by a one-dimensional particle in a box? Well, here's a plot here where we have position is on the x-axis and energy is on the y-axis. It's important that you don't get confused because you say box, right? And you see this, this a drawing like this and you start thinking maybe it's a, the box has a height to it. It does not, right? The y-axis is energy. So this is a really important thing to uh, pay attention to. Uh, and basically, um, the energy of the system as, as uh, due to its position, inside the box is zero, outside the box it's infinity, right? So basically, if you're able to get a particle into a box like this, it can never escape, right? No matter how hard it rams into the edge of the box, it can't get out. And it can't even make its way into the wall at all, right? And, um, you know, one way you can kind of think about this is, and now granted, this is only for an infinitely strong wall, right? The V of X equals infinity. Notice that's that's very important here. If that's less than infinity, then there's actually, you know, you can get a probability of seeing the particle in the wall itself, but not for the infinitely strong um, particle in a one-dimensional box here, which is what we're dealing with today. Um, and so one way that, as far as like getting a mental picture of this, sometimes I like to tell my students to think about it almost as if like you had a, a tube with rubber stoppers on the end and there's a marble in the middle, right? And just think that, that, you know, the tube is, you know, the particle is really small, infinitesimally small particle in an infinitesimally narrow tube. So the, the particle can move left and right, and that's all it can do. It has no sense of what, you know, up and down is, forwards and backwards, only left and right. That's all it knows. It has one degree of freedom. All it can do is move along the x-axis. So, um, you know, now granted, for a quantum particle in a box like this, right, it won't be quite like a marble, right? You can't just necessarily see it just anywhere or with any, you know, any momentum at once, right? It's going to be quantized, but we'll get into that moving forward. But uh, yeah, so this is what we mean, this is what we mean by a one-dimensional particle in a box, right? All it can do is go left and right, and today we're dealing with an infinitely strong um, box that it's stuck in, right? So basically... The energy is zero on the inside of the box, the potential energy is zero inside of the box, and the potential energy is infinite outside of the box. So it can never, ever escape. Okay, so one uh, item that we uh, I thought it's worth talking about real quick is defining a complex conjugate. What is that? Because uh, we need that for today. Um, so complex numbers are numbers that uh, have a real part added to an imaginary part. So let's look at an example of a complex number. Well, actually, before we do that, uh, what do we mean by imaginary? That's weird, right? So imaginary numbers are uh, numbers that are multiplied by the square root of negative one. So basically we just say, hey, the square root of negative one, that exists, and we're going to call it i, right? So um, 
here's an example of a complex number using that, right? So if I say four plus five i, the real part is four and the imaginary part is five, right? Five i. Um, so that's, that's basically what we mean. And so if we talk about a complex number that's four plus five i, what I mean by a complex conjugate is just take the imaginary part and multiply it by negative one. So the complex conjugate of four plus five i is just four minus five i. That's all I mean by this. And by the way, it goes the other way too. The complex conjugate of four minus five i would then be positive four plus, uh, or four plus positive five i. <laughs> so uh, they're complex conjugates of each other. Okay, so if we multiply these complex conjugates together, notice what happens, right? If, if i is the square root of negative one, then i times i is negative one. And so if we multiply these things, we see that basically that 20i, right, they cancel out and we're left with 41. So we started with a complex number and it produced a real number, right? 41 doesn't have an imaginary part. Um, so this is a really important thing. And, uh, you know, it's going to come up again today. And I thought this is a good thing to uh, talk about real quick before we move on. Another concept from mathematics that uh, we're going to need today for our conversation on this is defining separability. What do we mean by separability? Well, if I have a function that is a function of multiple variables, right? So I have f of x and y has two variables in it. it looking at it as the expanded polynomial there, you might say that, okay, it has some terms that are, you know, functions of both x and y, right? So four, um, minus 4xy. That's a term in here that, that's a function of both x and y. But it turns out if you do the algebra here, you can actually separate it so that um, this f of x, uh, x and y is also equivalent to uh, x minus y squared times y plus 1 squared. So notice that x minus 1 squared doesn't have y in it, and y plus 1 squared doesn't have x in it. So basically, we're able to write this function as the product of two functions of only one variable, right? So we have this multivariable function, f of x and y, but we can write it as the product of two functions that are only a function of one variable or the other. That's separable, that's all we mean by that. Uh, so an example of one that is not separable, uh, down below there, see that y times the sine of x minus y. Um, so that's, that's a function of y times a function of x and y, right? Sine of x minus y. Uh, you actually, you can't separate this. And, and mathematicians actually have ways of, of testing for separability. Uh, but today, the way we're going to use it is by just sort of imposing a, a concept of separability. So we're not going to go in, into how you prove whether or not something is separable. Uh, the purpose of this slide is just to make sure you know what it means if something is separable. So that's separability. All right, so let's get into it. Let's let's get into the uh, what we actually want to do today now that we have um, some of the background information covered. So here's the Schrodinger equation, right? This is the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. And, uh, you know, de deriving it is actually a pretty difficult thing to do. We're not going to derive it today. Uh, we're going to show how we can uh, use it to solve it for this case of the one-dimensional particle in a box. And it's important to notice that, right, this is a function of both time, t, and position, x. They're both in here. Um, and oftentimes you'll see the Schrodinger equation and they'll show you uh, the time independent Schrodinger equation that doesn't have time in it. Um, so this is an important distinction, right? This is, this is the real deal Schrodinger equation that, you know, the time dependent uh, Schrodinger equation, right? And, and the time independent one is also uh, a very, very useful. You can do quite a bit with it. So, um, you know, I'm not uh, throwing shade at it. I'm just saying that uh, if you want to talk time dependence, this is the one. Okay. So, um, Basically, this is a differential equation. So what's a differential equation? Well, basically, uh, differential equations, if you're trying to solve a differential equation, you have some information about a function's derivatives, and you're trying to figure out what function um, will fit the bill, right? What function will have those properties? Um, so for example, looking at this one, we're looking for a function that uh, if we take its derivative with respect to time, and then multiply that by ih bar, right, this is the left side, then that's equivalent to if I were to uh, first multiply that same function by the potential energy function, and then subtract from that h bar squared over 2m times the second derivative of psi with respect to its position, right? That's what, th that's what this means in like in English, right? If, if we're looking at this, right? How does this change? 
uh, basically we're saying that there's some relationship between where how this function changes with respect to time and how it changes with respect to position, right? They're, they're linked somehow. And the idea is to solve uh, an equation like this, we want to say like, okay, these are properties of the derivative of psi, but what, what psi actually fulfills that, right? What, what does that function look like? That's, that's solving a differential equation. That's what we mean by this. Um, another important thing to know uh, that you wouldn't know from looking at this equation, but I'm telling it to you, um, is that uh, the solutions to this, right? Psi of x and t. Uh, so you'll get some function of x and t, right? Um, if you get a solution of that, then that's, that's something called a wave function. We, we give it the name the wave function. And uh, at some point, I'm going to do a, a whole video on like, what is a wave function, right? But this, this is kind of a more advanced um, video than that. So this is kind of one that you would watch after you know at least roughly what a wave function is, right? As well as anyone does. So um, basically, another property of uh, a wave function, right? So step one, it makes this statement true, right? If you operate on it as this uh, statement tells you to operate, it's going to be true, right? The left side is going to equal the right side. Another thing about uh, this wave function is that if you multiply it by its complex conjugate, right? So if you take the function and any parts that have an i in front of it, you switch the sign, right? And then you just multiply that function by itself with just that small change of, of you know, things, the i's uh, flip sign, um, then uh, what that function is going to produce is something called a probability density function. And uh, I think I actually do have a video I did of that uh, a very long time ago about what a probability density function is. But basically, solutions to this, if you multiply them by their complex conjugate, that's going to give you a probability density function. Um, so for example, um, basically, where's the particle, right? Where's its position in x? It'll give you a probability density function of if you were to measure that particle's position, these are the places you would most likely see it, right? As, as far as a probability density function goes. Uh, and in fact, uh, if there are nodes in the function, there's going to be places you will never, ever see the particle, which is kind of an interesting thing to think of. So again, returning our focus to the point of this slide, um, a, a wave function that makes this statement true is considered a, a solution to this equation, right? That as, as far as solving a differential equation goes, you have found a solution to the Schrodinger equation. So it's a solution. But an interesting property about it is that if you multiply that solution by its complex conjugate, you will get a probability density function uh, that will describe the statistics of measuring the uh, particle's position x. Okay, now we're going to combine um, the Schrodinger equation uh, with separability, right? So we just talked about separability. So if you have a time-independent potential, right? So our potential energy function, V of x, if that thing does not change with time, right? Let's say you the particle in a box, right? It's in a box that is not changing size. The box is a constant size. It's never going to change. That's a time-independent potential. Uh, and if you have a time-independent potential, then it turns out that uh, the wave function, the way to you know the solution to this uh, differential equation, right? It turns out that solutions to this differential equation are going to be separable in terms of position and time. So we'll, the way we uh, typically write this is that we say that the big psi, right on the left, big psi of x and t equals phi of t times little psi of x. So notice, this is uh, uh, something people sometimes miss. Uh, we've gone from a big psi on the left to a little psi on the right. Big psi is time dependent, right? It's a function of both position and time. Little psi on the right is only a function of position. Okay? So... Uh, it doesn't seem like we've done much here by saying that uh, our wave function that's going to be a solution to the Schrodinger equation, we're going to assume that uh, it's it's going to be separable in terms of uh, it's going to be some function of only time multiplied by some function of only position. But it turns out this is a really uh, powerful thing to realize about a system uh, or perhaps approximate in, in cases where it's not quite, you know, 100% true, right? You can make an approximation and just not forget that you did that, right? And it's okay to make approximations, right? Look how much we've done with the ideal gas. Um, but uh, basically, this is a, a powerful thing to realize is that we can separate this because it makes the differential equation a lot easier to solve. So what we're going to do next is we're going to show that if we substitute in that phi of t times little psi of x in for big psi of x and t, uh, we're actually going to be able to rearrange the Schrodinger equation uh, in terms of 
you know, an only position dependent piece and an only time dependent piece, right? So it's not obvious yet. It's probably not obvious yet why being able to write these as a product of each other uh, is helpful. But uh, trust me, as we move forward, we're going to see that uh, as the uh, by splitting them up like this, uh, we actually end up being able to solve the Schrodinger equation for position and time separately. And then, of course, because we've created this uh, definition right here that the, the total solution is just a product of these two separate ones. We just multiply them together at the end and then we have our full solution. So it's sort of a divide and conquer type of strategy. Okay, so first let's uh, let's plug this in, right? So if we take uh, this uh, phi of t and psi of x and we plug that in there, what we end up getting is the expression at the bottom. Now clearly I, I've skipped a few steps, right? This is not an obvious jump, uh, but I suggest that, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I know sometimes that you hate to hear I leave this as an exercise for the reader, but I'm that's actually what I'm going to do here. And basically the, the, the big hint I'm giving you is that basically the product rule for derivatives and the fact that partial derivatives of functions with respect to a variable that they don't have are zero. Uh, it's going to able, you, you, this is not uh, too difficult to, to simplify. So basically if you just plug in this for psi here, we can actually write it as the bottom uh, equation here. So um, one thing here, let's take a look about it. What, what do you notice about this? Think about, you know, take a look at like the left side versus the right side. What do you know about uh, the position versus uh, the time? Well, the left side has no position and the right side is only position, right? The left side is only, only has to do with time. The right side only has to do with position. So what does this mean? Well, this actually has an interesting uh, consequence. It means that it must somehow be locked. So it turns out that if all of the time dependence is on the left side and all of the position dependence is on the right side, the only way that this can always be true is if they're both locked on to a constant and it must be the same constant. Right? They both must be equal to the same constant. That's the only way that you can assume that this is always true. Right? And, and you know, you saw us, you know, all we did was made that substitution of, of phi of t times psi of x in for big psi of x and t. Right? We were able to rearrange it to this. So uh, this actually ends up being an extremely powerful move here. So basically, the left side has to be to equal to a constant and the right side has to also be equal to a constant. So we're going to set it equal to a constant. We're going to choose E, right? And it'll be obvious why we chose, uh, we just happened to choose E as what we're calling our constant as we move forward. But uh, so this is a really important concept that because it was separable, we were able to separate this into solving um, two separate differential equations that on their own are much more straightforward than uh, it was together, right? If, if we couldn't assume that separability, uh, it's a much more difficult problem to solve. But now, because we could separate it, we, uh, we now have a path forward. So let's work on this one first. So we're gonna work on the time independent piece. Um, and so the time independent Schrodinger equation is, is one that uh, oftentimes uh, in, in courses and stuff, sometimes you'll see like, they'll just focus on this one. Uh, in, in particular, like uh, maybe a physical chemistry course, um, you know, the time will, will sort of get uh, overshadowed a little bit. Uh, but so this is the one that you, you'll see more frequently. So let's start with that one because it's, it's more common to see it. Um, so basically, let, you know, let's start here. And one thing we could do to simplify it a little bit is why don't we multiply both sides by psi, right? So whatever this wave function is, right? We don't know what it is yet. We're still trying to figure out what it is, but whatever it is, we can multiply both sides by it. That's fine. That's allowed. Uh, and so then now we'll get uh, this expression on the bottom here. That's the time independent Schrodinger equation. And I think this is probably the, the most common way that you'll see it uh, expressed. There's a few different ways to write it, but this is one of the uh, more common ways to see it. So looking at this now, and again, this is just a little reminder. Hey, this is little psi, right? And then assuming the big psi of x and t is this, right? That this is just our position dependence here. So that's just a reminder so we don't forget. Um, so let's solve this thing, right? So let's, let's solve this for a one dimensional particle in a box. So once again, we're stuck in this, or our particle is stuck in this one dimensional particle in a box where the potential energy equals zero on the inside and infinity on the outside. So if it's in there, it can never get out. Um, 
So uh, this is how we write that mathematically, right? What I just said. So let's just be uh, logical here, right? I told you the particle's in the box. It's an infinitely strong box, so it's in there, right? So we really only need to worry about the part where um, the potential energy of the particle is equal to zero, right? This is the only part that it's, it's actually going to experience because it's in there, right? So therefore, we can just look at the uh, Schrodinger equation uh, inside the box, which is this, right? Notice that we've uh, basically our potential energy function, V of X equals zero. So that dropped it out, right? You have zero times psi. So then this is what we're left with. So moving forward here, um, we can rearrange it a little bit. So if we write it this way, this is, uh, uh, this is actually maybe even a little easier to look at. We say, okay, we're, I'm looking for a function that uh, taking its second derivative with respect to the position and then multiplying that by negative one is equivalent to uh, taking that function and just multiplying it by 2me over h bar squared. Well, 2me over h bar squared, that's all a constant. So basically I'm saying, you know, is there a function you can think of that taking uh, the negative of its second derivative, you could have just, you could have just multiplied it by a constant and gotten it to that same point, right? So like, think of like, uh, you know, if, if you take uh, the, the derivative of, of sine is cosine, and then the derivative of cosine is negative sine. Oh, interesting, right? I, it, I could have just multiplied it by negative one, right? Uh, and, and gone from sine to negative sine. Or I could take its derivative twice, right? So this, it's, this is kind of what we're thinking here. So that was a giant hint of where we're going. Um, but that's what this equation means when we look at it. So, okay, this is obviously much easier differential equation to solve. I mean, I kind of just did it verbally right there uh, to a degree. Um, then the thing we started out with, right? So separability is really doing us some big favors here. So let's, uh, let's just uh, do a little notation thing to make things a little uh, easier to, to not accidentally drop something here, right? So um, we're gonna define k squared as being 2me over h bar squared. So that 2me over h bar squared, we're gonna call that k squared. So you see that over on the right side, that whole thing, we're gonna call it k squared now. So this is just renaming it, right? All right, so, so now this looks even more straightforward, right? It's basically saying, uh, you know, I'm looking for a function psi that um, if I take the second derivative of it with respect to x and then multiply that by negative one, that's the same as if I had just multiplied that same function by k squared, right? That's another way to think about this. So now we've simplified it even more. All right, so let's solve this thing. Um, well, the most general answer to this differential equation, right, sort of the one that'll catch anything, is this a sine kx plus b cosine kx. So that's that's sort of the thing that'll that'll um, catch all possible mathematical solutions here, right? Where a and b uh, is uh, some uh, coefficient, right? Um, but uh, you know, and and you know, I even recommend that like uh, try this, right? T try taking the second derivative of uh, one of these terms and multiplying it by negative one, and and you'll see that. Um, so uh, basically, you know, we've solved the differential equation, but remember, uh, we have boundary conditions to be concerned with, right? So not only uh, do we have to sort of make this statement up here true, remember that this 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 barrier here, right? the particle can never, ever, ever be in the barrier, right? No matter when you measure it, it's never gonna be there because that's an infinitely strong barrier. Well, then that means that the wave function must equal zero, zero outside of the box, right? The wave function has to be equal to zero because when you multiply it by its complex conjugate, um, that's gonna give you a probability density function that is zero in the walls, right? You never see it in the walls. So given that boundary condition now, now we have to be, uh, uh, now, now think about this. Do both of these terms work? So notice where zero is, right? Think about the sine of zero versus the cosine of zero. Do both of these work? All right, think about that for a second. No, they don't both work, right? The sine of zero is zero, but not cosine, right? So basically we're gonna say that B equals to zero for this solution. And we're gonna go with this uh, psi of, uh, you know, we're, we're gonna go with the other one, right? We're gonna say it's this sine value. So, um, okay, so psi equals a times sine kx, where a is some constant, that's gonna work, right? And and think about too, um, you know, a is like an amplitude, right? Cause uh, no matter how big the amplitude on the sine is, right? It's still gonna be zero at that wall on the left side. But is there another value that also must equal zero here? 
Think about that for a second. Where else does this function need to be equal to zero? Well, at L, right? So whatever the length of the box is, the length L, if I plug uh, L in there for X, I need to get a zero, right? Or else it's not a legal wave function due to the boundary condition, right? So even though it satisfies uh, the, the derivative is okay, it also has boundary conditions, right? We're bounding our problem here. Um, and so what happens actually is that that value of k is going to become quantized by this. There's going to be certain, uh, basically you can think of them as like allowed frequencies and disallowed frequencies, right? So we're seeing the quantization of the system start to emerge from the mathematics, right? We didn't, we didn't put that in there. It came out of the solutions here. So this is, this is really cool, right? That we're starting to see the quantum mechanics emerge, right? So this K value is going to be quantized. Only certain values of K are allowed. So what do I mean by that? Well, uh, if we look at this, so remember that K is N pi over L. And it turns out that only integer values work. And if you look at um, some of these uh, solutions here, right? So these are three different solutions to the time independent uh, Schrodinger equation for the one dimensional particle in a box, right? With an infinitely strong barriers, right? So if we look at this, these are, these are three legal solutions. These are all, these all work, right? Notice, notice the boundary conditions. Uh, the, the, uh, the wave function equals zero, both at the left side of the box at X equals zero and the right side of the box where X equals L. Um, and actually, uh, if you are uh, a musician and you've played a stringed instrument and you know what it is to play a harmonic, right? You'll note that uh, you can't play a harmonic anywhere you want on the string. There's only certain allowed places. And right in the middle of the harmonic where it goes an octave up, that's what you're seeing here on uh, the first excited state for n equals 2, right? So that, that of course, is, is wave mechanics of uh, a classical object, right? A vibrating string. Uh, but it's interesting that uh, the same physics applies here to the wave function as it does to a vibrating string. So anyway, we've got solutions here. And we're pretty close to having a, a complete wave function, but it's not quite there yet, right? So uh, in fact, let's talk about the energy values that are allowed. While, while, while we have this solution here, let's do some stuff with it, right? So we've, uh, we've defined k squared as being 2me over h bar squared. And you know, we want to know some actual values of uh, energy that we can measure here. So let's, let's do a little bit of algebra. And uh, what we could do is we can rearrange this. And um, basically, we can get an expression for energy. So if k squared equals n squared pi squared over l squared, and that equals 2me over h bar squared, right? Because that's how, how, we, how we defined it here. Uh, if you solve that for energy, right? We get energy by itself on, on the left side here. Then you've got n squared pi squared h bar squared over 2lm squared. Um, and then this is, uh, this is the expression for energy. And in fact, you can simplify that a little bit too, right? Because uh, remember, uh, h, h bar is... Uh, just Planck's constant over over 2 pi, right? So I can expand that there over on the right there. We can simplify it a little bit, so we might as well, right? Because we have that, that pi squared in the numerator. So that's how we know to do that, right? We say, okay, well, let's make this h bar squared over, let's just make it h squared over 2 pi squared and then simplify that a little further. So then and here we have the more, uh, um, perhaps the expression you more expected to see, right? Energy equals n squared h squared over 8 ml squared. So, uh, so that's the energy level pattern of the one dimensional particle in the box that, um, you know, if you've, uh, you know, if you're at the point in, in studying quantum mechanics that you should be looking at the time dependent solutions, you've seen that before. So, um, all right. So as I said, this wave function is almost where we need it to be, but it's not quite there. So we know that the solution needs to be a times the sine of n pi x over L. That's what the solution is going to look like. Um, but as I said, if we multiply this thing by its complex conjugate, it needs to give us a probability density function of where we're going to see the particle if we measure it. Well, probability density functions, if I integrate it over all space, think about this for a moment. If I integrate this function over all space, I multiply it by its complex conjugate, and that gives me a probability density function. I integrated over all values of x, what should I get? Well, I, I should get 1, right? Because it's a probability density function. I told you the particle exists. So if I measure, so, so the probability of finding it anywhere has to be 1, right? Because the particle isn't disappearing on us. 
So uh, yeah, the area under that needs to be one. So we need to just choose a value of a so that that's true. And remember that as far as solving the differential equation goes, we can make a whatever we want it to be, and it's going to be a legal solution. So we're going to choose a value of a that ensures what's called normalization. And so here's what that would look like. If I multiply uh, this a sine n pi x over l as our wave function, if I multiply that by its complex conjugate, well, I don't see an i in there, right? Okay, there's an i in the word sine, but you know what I mean. We don't see the i as in the square root of negative one i. That's not in there. So the complex conjugate of that function, it's its own complex conjugate, right? There's nothing to make negative here. So you just multiply it by itself. So if I do that, I've got a squared times sine squared of uh, n pi x over l, right? So that's that's what happens if 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 I square if if I multiply this function by its complex conjugate. It's just equivalent to squaring it. And then, of course, that integral from 0 to L, right? because we know it can't be outside of the box. So even though I say we integrate over all space, the rest of the space doesn't matter because the particle's in the box, right? This is, this is one of our assumptions. So uh, therefore, all we have to do is integrate from 0 to L. That's all we need to do. And that answer is going to give us 1. It needs to give us 1. So we haven't chosen a value of A yet, but I can set this equal to 1 because it has to, right? So then if I just uh, you know, basically take this integral and solve for A, I'm going to know what A needs to be. So that's what we do next. And actually, for convenience, uh, there's going to be like another a later. I'm, I'm just going to change the a to an n. So we're going to call it n squared, right? So this is the same thing as that, but we're just going to call it n squared for now uh, because it's our normalization constant n. OK. So we need to take this integral. And uh, it turns out that this is a known integral, right? So before things like uh, uh, you know Wolfram's uh, uh, Mathematica were around that you could uh, you know plug this in and take an integral, people would look up in, in tables of integrals, and I, I think you probably still do this in some classes. Um, and this is a known integral, right? The, the si integral of sine squared of something, uh, of sine squared of ax, where a is just some constant. Uh, so we need to figure out what to set a to. Um, you know, but we're going to be taking a definite integral, so we're not actually going to worry about that plus a constant as much, right? Because we're, we're going to be taking a difference here. Um, but uh, so we just need to figure out what do we call a here? Well, we've got uh, what the sine of n pi over l times x. Okay, n pi over l that must be a. There it is. So there we define n pi over l as our a, and then uh, essentially, you know, I've I've shown the work over here. Uh, but that integral ends up just being L over 2, or 1 half L at the bottom left there. But, you know, take your time, look at the slide, pause it if you need to, make sure that this makes sense, make sure that, that, that it's correct and you, and you understand why it's correct, right? So if we do that, right, so this integral here at the bottom left, from 0 to L of sine squared n pi x over L dx, right, taking that is just going to be 1 half L. So our original expression, remember we have this expression here, right? Let's just put... Uh, um, let's just put our L over 2 there, right? So this whole thing right here is going to become L over 2. So if we do that, we're going to get this, right? This is our L over 2. This is n squared, and that equals 1. So just solve it for n. And then so n ends up being the square root of 2 uh, over L. So we have a normalization constant. Now we know what it is. So this now we have a legit wave function, right? This is our normalized wave function where if we multiply, so number one, it is a legal solution to our differential equation and its boundary condition, right? So it, it follows the right rules for the derivative and it's zero in the right places. And then also, if you multiply this by the complex conjugate of itself, again, in this case, it just ends up being squaring it because there's no uh, square root of negative one here, right? There's no complex part. Um, then that's going to give us a probability density function that if we integrate it over all space, it gives us one, right? Because that's a really important property. A, a, a probability density function needs to be normalized. All right, so we have our position uh, wave function, our you know time independent solution, uh, but we still need to get the solution for the time dependent part. So let's uh, let's give a green check mark to the one on the right we got that part remember back when we separated it right we we used uh, this concept of separability to take our problem and break it up into two easier problems the one on the right is now solved now we can focus on getting the time dependence all right so let's uh, let's solve the time dependent piece on the bottom left there let's only work on that part so uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to write it in a slightly more straightforward uh, to look at expression here. And if you look at that, you know, 
take a moment and think about the algebra to get from that top line to the second line there. And uh, if it doesn't immediately uh, look apparent to you, well, there is a property of i, right? The square root of negative one has this property. And it's counterintuitive, I think, uh, if you haven't seen it before. But one over i is equal to negative i. So that's weird, right? Usually you don't take the inverse of something and then it, it, it switches sign, right? That's kind of uh, uh, maybe a little unusual. Um, but the proof is, is uh, simple uh, down here at the bottom. Basically, if we have 1 over i, we start with that, and then I multiply that by i over i, right? Because anything over itself is just 1, and then multiplying by something by 1, well, that's just the identity. We can always do that and get the same thing back. So that's legal. We multiply by i over i, and then if you look at the denominator there, uh, i squared is, of course, negative 1. So then we get negative i. So this is true, right? It, it maybe looks a little funny to you, but it is true. And uh, so that's how we got that expression up there that's even more straightforward to look at. And in fact, what does that mean if we translate that to plain English? We say, okay, what function phi of t uh, exists so that uh, taking its derivative with respect to t is equivalent to just multiplying that function by minus i over h bar e. All right, this is what we're trying to solve. This is the dif differential equation we're currently trying to solve. So if we do this, uh, it turns out uh, that this is the answer, right? So we're going to, you know, we're thinking of functions that uh, we take the first derivative and uh, we get a function back multiplied by something. And of course, uh, you know, if you think of the, the chain rule here, right? So we should test this out. So that's a, that, this is a, a, an answer here. Um, is, uh, you know, this cosine of minus e over h bar t plus i sine of minus e over h bar t. So this is a wave function that does have an imaginary part, right? So if we were going to multiply this by its complex conjugate, we do need to flip the sign on the part with the i, right? So don't forget that that's there. Very important. But let, let's check this. Let's check this as a solution here. So, so if, if this is my phi of t, let's take its derivative with respect to time and see what we get. So if we do that, the derivative of cosine is, of course, negative sine, but then we have a chain rule here, so then that uh, minus e to the over h bar comes out front and flips the sign back, right? And then the same thing happens with derivative of sine is cosine, but then, of course, that, uh, that constant in front of the t comes out front uh, by the chain rule. So that's what we get if we take the derivative. Now let's just try taking our original wave function and not take any derivatives, just multiply it by minus i over h bar times e. And if we do that, yeah, sure enough, we do get the same thing. So, you know, this is point, you know, maybe uh, uh, pause the video, think about it, make sure that this really is true. It all makes sense to you, all right? But this, they really are equivalent. So, okay, cool. We have solved uh, this particular uh, wave function, right? This, this time dependence, this phi of t. So, yeah, they do match. Okay, so moving forward. Now that we have both a wave function for the time dependence and we have a wave function uh, for the time independent Schrodinger equation, right? The one that was for uh, the position, right? That was the one that um, uh, the little psi of only x. So let's put them together. We got to put these things together, right? Because the whole idea here from the outset, we said, okay, if we can get these separate. So first, the, one th the third one down here, right? Big psi of x and t is equal to phi of t times psi, little psi of x, right? This was, our, um, this was our assumption we put in the beginning. We said, okay, as long as our, our potential uh, energy function is constant in time, this is actually a very good um, uh, assumption to make. And um, then, then we, separate, we solve these things individually. So psi of t is at the top, then we have, um, or excuse me, phi of t is at the top, and then little psi of x is right under that. So all we have to do is multiply these two things together and we have the complete solution to the Schrodinger equation. So we've now solved the Schrodinger equation. Um, our, uh, our big psi of x and t is uh, this uh, equation at the very bottom here. So, um, so what can we do with that? Well, let's take a look at it, uh, both the real part and the imaginary part. So you may have seen things like this on the, the FET simulator. We're going to talk about that soon. Uh, it's a really great... Um, piece of software for, for education. Uh, amazing uh, stuff. Uh, I'll, I have a shout out to it later uh, when we use it again, but that's where this was, uh, that's where I got this from. 
Um, but if you look at the orange piece, that's the real part of the wave function, and the imaginary part of the wave function is the blue part. So basically, you, know, you could say, okay, how do you how do you plot uh, a complex function? There's this imaginary part. It's it's multiplied by the square root of negative one. Like what you know what what is that? What's going on, right? Well, you could just say like almost like treat it as like you know plot it like it's a second function, right? And just say like okay, that whole thing that's multiplied by i. This is this is everything but the i is in blue, and then uh, the orange part. That's the real part. That's the the part uh, that does not involve i, right? So this is a complex function here. So this is a single function. It looks like two functions the way it's plotted, but that is one function. It's just the real and the imaginary component of that function. And we see that they're both moving as a function of time. Well, if you notice, if you if you just kind of stare at one of them, right? Like only pay attention to the blue one now and see right there, it went flat, right? The function, you know, the function, the amplitude of it is not constant, right? It's, it's, it's getting bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller. And the amplitude function is actually the first part of each term here, right? We have the cosine of minus e over h bar t. And here we got the sine of minus e, h bar, e over h bar t, right? That's our time dependence. That's our amplitude. So our amplitude is oscillating, right? It's, these are oscillating functions, right? Sine and cosine, they, they oscillate. They go back and forth. So basically... Um, you know, the amplitude is, 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 is getting positive and big and then goes down to zero and then it gets to negative and big, right? It's going back and forth, but one is cosine and the other one's sine. So they're, you know, they're out of phase with each other. They're not, they're not going at the same time, right? Basically, uh, uh, one, one peaks when the other one is flat. So this is the real and the imaginary part of the wave function plotted together. It's one wave function, but it has two parts, a real part and an imaginary part. And so this is how we, we represent these things. And so when you see them moving like this, that amplitude function out front is basically multiplied by a regular sine function, right? Because remember our solutions to the positions, right? The, the, the little psi of x, uh, all those solutions, they were, they're all sine functions. So you just have a sine function multiplied by either a cosine function or a sine function, but this is just the amplitude, right? This is just the thing that's making it bigger or smaller as a function of time. So that's why it's moving is because of those uh, amplitudes that are functions of cosine or sine. All right, so we've got a real part and an imaginary part. And, you know, I've been, uh, you know, saying this entire time, if we multiply a wave function, once we have the wave function, we can then get a probability density function for measuring the particle. Where are we going to see it, right? And um, so let's do that, right? So what we have at the bottom here with these uh, green and the, and the purple boxes is I'm multiplying the complex conjugate of psi by psi, right? So I'm just taking this wave function at the top. To get the complex conjugate, this plus right here just goes to a negative, right? Because it's the only place we have an i. That's the only i here. So um, you just multiply these two together, right? And you remember the foil, right? First, outer, inner, last, right? We have two terms in each one of these parentheses, so it's like a giant foil operation here, right? So if, if you write out all the steps, it, it, you know, you'd be writing for a little bit, but you can do it. It's totally doable. In fact, I encourage you to do it. You should do it. Don't just take my word for it that this stuff is true. So if we do uh, expand, as we said, do like a, this like foil type process, um, you know, I'd like to point out before we do it that, uh, you know, multiplying, uh, say, x plus a times x minus a, that's kind of what's going on here, right? Like there's obviously a lot more than just an x and an a there, but you've got basically something minus something times something plus that same something, right? So there's just a sign changing and you're gonna get a similar process here, right? Where um, basically that after you've done this type of uh, foil problem like you see at the bottom there, you know that those middle terms are gonna cancel out and you're just gonna have the first one times the first one and then uh, added to that the last one times the last one, right? So that's why we get an x squared minus an a squared. So it's the same sort of thing, right? If you if you take the time to do this, and, and I do encourage you to write it out yourself, right? Make sure this is true. So, um, but yeah, we expand this, and uh, this is what we get, right? This is this is the prob this is a probability density function, and maybe that's not obvious looking at the equation, but we'll plot it later, and it'll become more obvious. So let's look at some plots of this. And so this is kind of interesting, right? So I, this is something kind of unique that I do when I teach this. Um, if you look at the term on the left, I have that one colored blue, and then the one on the right I have colored in red. And you notice that, uh, you know, there's this, uh, this cosine squared function and a sine squared function is the amplitude. 
right? So just like before, remember we saw like a time dependent part that was an amplitude. And like the last time we did this with just the wave function, it was a, it was a cosine function and a sine function. Um, so those oscillate both positive and negative, but this is cosine squared and sine squared as a function of time. So those are gonna, only gonna oscillate between a, a zero and a positive number here. And it turns out that notice how the, the, the blue box, right? The blue box that goes with the blue distribution below as the blue one goes down, the red one goes up, right? As the red one goes up, the blue one goes down, right? They always go opposite. And if you sum the two together, which is what we do, right? This, uh, you know, I, I'm plotting the separate terms separately here, but really the function is just a sum, right? And if you look at the sum of the blue and the red, uh, that one is actually a, a, a function of time as well, but it's the same thing every time, so you don't see anything move, right? So that basically the, the, this, is, this is why um, for some states here, we call them stationary states, that although there is time dependence in the uh, wave function, right, this time dependent solutions to the uh, Schrodinger equation, um, although there is time dependence there, uh, it actually cancels out. So basically, uh, that's what we're seeing here, is that the probability density function, if you make a measurement of this system, it's going to be that purplish color on the right, just static. It does not change in time. And that's why we call it a stationary state, right? The probability density function does not change in time. The wave functions, those are time dependent, right? Those are changing. But when you actually uh, generate the probability density function for a stationary state, that thing does not move, right? The probability density function stays the same. Um, and yeah, so so basically another, you know, this is another way to describe this is say this is a, a pure single eigenstate, right? This is a single eigenstate. You can do something called a superposition, where you have a combination of different eigenstates. Um, but uh, in this case, we're talking about a single eigenstate, and so it's called a stationary state. Um, so now let's look at something uh, else here. So uh, here's kind of another way to look at the same thing, right? So if you use the FET simulator, so there's the equation over there on the left, or sorry, the uh, website on the bottom left, right? This is a, a set of uh, simulation tools from... Um, uh, University of Colorado Boulder, these things are great. Highly suggest that uh, uh, you play with them. Um, but basically, notice how that the time is moving forward there in femtoseconds. And basically what I'm doing is I'm toggling between the probability density function in white right there and the wave function shown in uh, uh, blue and orange, right? Where I, I believe it was the real part is in orange and the imaginary part is in blue, right? That's one wave function, right? So the wave function is moving in time, but the probability density function is not. And so this is basically that same sort of thing uh, that, you know, going back and forth here, we see that like probability density function is stationary because this is a stationary state. It's a single eigenstate. Um, and uh, by the way, so looking at this thing, can you tell what quantum state we're in for the uh, quantum particle in a box? So there's a, there's a single node there in, in, the, in, the, in the middle of the box, right? Of course, we have the nodes at the end because the, the particle cannot be in the uh, walls of the container, right? It has to be somewhere inside the container. So it goes to zero there, of course, but we have a node in the middle. We have one node. So that means we must be in um, the n equals two state, right? So uh, this, we would call this the first excited state. Because the, the lowest one is the ground state, where n equals 1. This, is, this means we're in the first excited state. So what about states that are not stationary states? Well, uh, here's an example here, where we have uh, what we call a linear combination of multiple states. So here we're, we're combining the ground state with the second excited state. So again, remember that uh, basically out of, out of the solutions of the possible states that our system can be in, these wave functions, we, there, there's basically an n, there's a value of n that needs to be an integer in order to be an allowed solution, right? A, a common scenario in, in um, solving differential equations is that you don't get a single, um, you don't get a single solution, right? A single function that is the only solution to your, your differential equation. It's very common that you actually get a family of solutions that all fit the bill, right? They all, they all match what the differential equation uh, problem set out uh, for us to find. Um, so this is an example where we take two, uh, two solutions, right? The ground state solution and the second excited state solution. So two separate solutions where we have uh, the quantum number equals uh, n equals 1 and the other one where n equals 3. And it turns out that um, 
solutions uh, to the Schrodinger equation, you can actually do any linear combination of acceptable solutions. So you can do one of the pure eigenstates, right, which we saw before, that was a stationary state. And now this one is uh, what we call a superposition state that is a linear combination of ground state where n equals one and the excited state where n equals three. Uh, and notice that that probability density function shown below in white Notice how it's moving. That is not stationary, right? That's a probability density function and it's changing in time. So that means that basically the statistics of, you know, your observation of asking, hey, where is the particle? You measure where's the particle? It depends when you make that measurement. You're going to get uh, different probabilities of different positions being the answer uh, depending when you make that measurement. Whereas when it was the pure eigenstate of only n equals 2, Right, that previous one we showed that was a stationary state, it, it didn't matter, right? If you, if you make the measurement, the, the uh, probability density function is always the same. Um, and so this is, this is how you see time-dependent um, probability density functions is when you have a superposition. And this one is roughly, uh, you can think of it as a, a little over 27% ground state and a little over 72% uh, second excited state. So, um, and I say a little over because you'll notice that doesn't quite add up to 100%, but if I included all the decimal places, it would. All right, folks, I think this is a good place to stop. Uh, I encourage you to check out that FET simulator and really try and gain even more uh, intuition for this topic. And uh, I really hope this was helpful. All right, take care, everybody.